Hey guys, welcome to Quinnia's Budget Crafts. So, uh, one big problem I have with Gaslands is I can't get anybody to play with me because they don't want to make teams. So, um, how about we make some pre-made teams? Okay, hold on a second. So, uh, this is, you know, past me. You'll, you'll see the other guy in, in uh, another video. Um, you may have noticed that I have the green shirt and, and, and the other green shirt. That's because I don't want to spray paint or Mod Podge or anything like that on any of my decent clothes. Which means, I need an apron. Let's make one. So before I start like cutting up materials and all that stuff, let's, let's talk about materials real quick. I am going to use leather, you could use canvas, or cloth, or wool, or I don't know, an old leather jacket from a secondhand store, it doesn't really matter. Whatever you want to use is fine. And as far as patterns go, you can go to any place that says uh, sewing and they're titled, or like Hobby Lobby's, Michael, Walmart, um, any, any place that sells sewing supplies really is going to have a pattern for an apron. The only thing is though, I don't really like those patterns, and I'll show you why in just a sec. But uh, on the topic of leather, do not buy leather from Tandy's. The kitty agrees. Uh, leather at Tandy's is insanely expensive. You can go to Hobby Lobby. I know a bunch of y'all don't like Hobby Lobby, but you know what? Shop where you can afford to, all right? If you go to Hobby Lobby, they have these. This is one giant piece of suede for 17 bucks. You are not going to find that at uh, Tandy's. So they'd want like at least 80. And it really is one big, giant, awesome, super nice piece of suede. You can also get like the stiff leather that you can do tooling on or whatever. I wanted the suede because it's more fabric-like, but it's a lot tougher than fabric. So yeah, get your get your leather from... Do you mind? So yeah, get your leather from Hobby Lobby or some other store you can tolerate shopping at that uh, is going to have better prices than Tandy's because, man, Tandy's wants some, some gold for their leather. All right, so on to the uh, patterning itself. All right, so hopefully you can see pretty well. This right here is a rubberized butcher's apron. Don't ask. But I actually really like the shape of this thing with a slight exception. And I'll show you real quick. Here, I put this on, but I'm have to move the microphone. That's going to be noisy. All right, so I guess I'll just hold the mic. Hopefully there's enough light here. You can actually see what's going on. But the, uh, the corners of the butcher's apron cut off right around here. Right where my finger is going. It's kind of dark. But uh, I don't like that because if you get splatter, it's going to splatter this section of your shirt. So what I think I'm going to do is fold it up like this. That way the uh, things here are much closer now. So it goes right across there because I'm like very broad across the chest or, you know, just I'm fat. But uh, yeah, I want it to cover all of my shirt. It's not really warm enough in here for a jacket, but I usually wear one. So I'm wearing it for this anyway. I want it to cover the jacket too. The only bad thing about this is now if you were to put the strap right about here where your waist is, you got this floppy bit here, which means that's going to have to be adjusted to fit that. So I'm just going to use the folded portion of this apron to outline basically what goes on the leather and then cut it accordingly. The other thing I don't really want to do um, that the butcher's apron has is you can't see it because there's a desk in the way. But this thing goes down to about mid shin. They're, they're super, super long. So I don't need it that long. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll trim the bottom of it off. Also, one thing every apron does that I really don't like is this. I don't want anything touching the back of my neck. And I intend to put uh, tool pouches on the chest portion here so you don't want the tools pulling the weight on the back of your neck. So I'm going to change how this strap works as well. So let's go ahead and get this laid out onto the uh, leather and uh, trace and cut it out. For tracing out the pattern, I just used the apron that I'm using as a pattern, put it on top of the leather and traced around it. I had to make a couple exceptions because for one, I don't really actually want it quite as big as this apron, but also there's a couple spots where like the leather is not big enough to accommodate that. So I just marked that and drew the lines accordingly. It's really pretty simple. You just put your pattern on and trace around it. If you're using material and a paper pattern, you just put the pattern on, pin it in place, and then cut around it. Okay, so for actually cutting this thing, we're going to use a square, metal square, because if you use plastic or wood, you could, you know, cut into it, and that would defeat the purpose of using the square. And also, we're going to use the rotary cutter. I think I've mentioned this many times before, but uh, yeah, these are really, really, really nice for cutting pretty much anything you don't have to worry about squishing, I guess. So for leather, definitely rotary cutter. 
Gonna cut the top portion off nice and square first. I don't think I recorded it, but how I found the square on that is I went from my dots that you saw me making um, with a yardstick, and then I put the square across that line, and then it comes up this way, so I have a nice square line across here as well. So yeah, anyway, go ahead and lay your stuff out on your cutting mat. And then you can just use the rotary cutter and make a nice clean cut all the way across. Always keep the material you're cutting away uh, from your pattern on the outside of where you're cutting so that if you were to mess up and veer off to the side, it's okay. You didn't cut into your pattern, you cut into the excess and who cares. So even though this entire piece of leather was really pretty cheap, any kind of scraps you get like this, I mean like this is a that's a pretty big piece. They could like make a pouch or something out of that. Don't throw these away. Keep these in a like a scrap bag or something. So one thing I did not notice when I was putting the apron on to pattern it out is this right here. Some some careless skinner kind of went off into this thing. You can see where it goes together pretty much perfectly right there. So that's going to be the bottom of the apron. So I need to uh, do a square line straight across and just trim the bottom section off. Because I did get my square from this line for the top portion, initially I'm going to use this again for my square line going to trim that off. If your run is going to be longer than you have, you can of course double it over. That'll work totally fine. The rotary cutter will do doubles. Problem with doubling it though is you have to make absolutely certain everything is still square and that's really difficult to do, so I'm going to do it in pieces. There we go. Now we have another really large piece you could use for who knows what, and it has at least one square edge to work off of. So that's going to be pretty handy for future projects. I don't know what yet, but I'll do something with it. Also, one thing to note uh, when you're putting leather away, it will actually wrinkle. So try not to uh, crease it too hard or have any spots where it's like, you know, jumped, jumbled over. You don't want any kind of thing like that. Just keep it nice and flat, same way you'd fold some kind of fabric. Another nice thing about the rotary cutter is you can use something heavy, like a square, to hold down leather so it doesn't move too much, and then use the rotary cutter to make these curves. Oh yeah, something I should mention with the, the cutting of this stuff. If you um, are going to be sewing the edge over like this, so you have a nice, nice neat edge, which I actually am going to do, you might want to leave yourself however much it is, a half an inch or something, so you have edges to do. I don't mind losing an inch, and I had kind of a limited amount of material to work with for the size of the thing I'm doing, so. Okay, so now the easiest way to make sure that both sides match is to get the one side you already have done, double it over, and then trim it accordingly. So, let's make sure this is all lined up. So this one side of the apron has this weird piece where they had originally cut it out, so it's got an extra bit of curve there. And this side doesn't, it's fine. Also the bottom isn't matching up because I think the bottom of the apron actually had a flare to it. I don't want to flare though, so I'll probably just end up trimming that um, even across the bottom when I'm done. Mostly I want to make sure that the top is the same side to side so it's not pinching anywhere. I also want to straighten out this curve so it doesn't have two curves. So I'll probably start here. All right, so now if I get it to where everything matches up, I can just go ahead and trim the unevenness off of the bottom here. And we can have a look at what we got. Alright, so the total length is like a uh, chop keeps type apron. It's about mid-thigh. And if I move the camera... And 
but you can kind of see there it uh, it covers. So now we need to talk about putting straps on this thing. Okay, so for the straps on this thing, there are two things that I do not like. I don't like the the thing that ties around your back. So you have the strings hanging down. For one, I, I sit in this chair a lot, so I'll be sitting on the strings and untying my apron, which would be irritating. But if I'm standing up, well, the cat's gonna want to play with those. So. Um, no, no strings. I'm going to use like a belt style and then using a belt style will also allow me to change the top portion here instead of having it, I don't know if I'm going to be able to talk, instead of having it like that, instead of having it, can you hear me? Instead of having it like this with the strap that goes up and sits on the back of your neck, it's pretty uncomfortable. Because there's going to be a belt around the back here, what I can do is have a strap running from the corner here, straight over your shoulder, down your back, to the belt. Hopefully you heard that. I just realized I was covering the microphone. So, uh, yeah, we'll do some straps. I don't want to use, like, overly thick leather. With the straps, you could use this. Uh, you saw how stretchy it was. I don't, I don't think it'd be really a problem because it's an apron. It's not like an armor piece or whatever. You don't need it to stay rigid, but uh, you, you might not want it stretching though, depending on how much tool weight you've got in the chest portion or whatever. So we'll be using a, uh, a stiffer leather, but not, not like a belt. Probably something like this, like we put on the bottom of the uh, that box. It doesn't have any stretch, but it is still pliable. And like I mentioned when I was cutting the stuff, don't throw away your scraps. This this is what was scraps. And these are pretty decent sized pieces. I mean, it's a lot more than just this one. And this one is useful. So keep your scraps. All right. I think I got sorted what leathers I want to use for the straps. For the belt, I'm going to use this really thin pliable um, whatever. But the reason I want to use this, though, is because if I double it over, that will make it thick enough for a belt and it will have a slick surface for any you know, of the straps to slide across. That'll make sense when we get to sewing. For the straps for the from the neck to the belt, I'm just going to use one of the pieces from the actual apron portion itself. This should be long enough to go ahead and cut some nice straight strips out of. So let's go ahead and cut those out. Don't worry about how long you're making them. As long as it's long enough, you can trim it later. As for what width you cut them, that is up to you depending on uh, how wide you want your straps to be and you know you got to account for some folding over. You don't want them too thin like this stropping strap I use for um, stropping my razor blades. This is really thin. If this were pulling on your your neck really hard like that, it would it would hurt. So you want them wider than this, but you also don't want it so wide that it just folds in on itself. So that uh, kind of depends on how tight the strap's going to be and what the material is and that kind of stuff. About two inches, which is what this uh, this square's width is here. That's about right if you consider you're folding some over. If you're not folding it over, then the smaller section of this, which is about an inch and a half, seems to be pretty good. For the belt, I am doing a three inch width here because I'm going to double it over. So it'll be one and a half inches in the end. This leather cuts really easy. Super nice. All right, so there's the strip for the belt. It's a little uneven here because the way it was folded, it's fine. Won't matter once we fold everything over. All right, so when you fold leather in half, there are two ways to do it. You can literally just fold it in half, and that is fine, except you're going to have one seam down here that has the raw edges, which may or may not be a deal breaker for you. It depends on what you're using it for, if you're going to see that seam, that kind of thing. Or you can fold it into thirds, which, eventually, which, which actually folds it in half, like so, and then your outside edges are nice, rounded, um, you know, smooth edges. You don't have to worry about any kind of thing. You just have the one seam down the middle that no one's ever going to see. You could also do that like a sock almost. You sew it into a tube, 
wrong side out and you flip it back around and you'll have a seam like this. Which I think is probably what I'm going to do just for the sake of my own sanity. Trying to cross stitch back and forth on this where no one's ever going to see it is pointless and very time consuming. So we'll flip it this direction to where the um, outside of it is going to be on the inside when it's folded. Then we can just sew straight down the one seam and then turn it wrong side out and then it'll be good to go. As for these and the apron material itself, we're just going to fold the one edge over just like I did, actually wrong way, just like I did on the, uh, the things, the straps on the box, just so you have the nice rounded edge, you know, you don't want to make it too big or too thin or it'll be digging into your, your shoulder and that's not what you want either. So I'll get those folded over and then we will sew them. I'll show you how that works. I'll do most of the sewing off camera though because it's going to be incredibly time consuming. Alright, so for sewing we're going to use this thing. It's called an awl. And this thing, which is like a, it's like a little spur, comes with a few more of these spurs with different teeth spacing. You just run that down your thing to get a line of dots where you need to put your needles to keep your stitches evenly spaced. Uh, for this thing though, if you buy one of these from Tandy's or whatever, Amazon, buy a bunch of versions that are not Tandy's branded, the same thing. Um, you're either going to use this black thread it comes with, which is like an artificial sinew, but it's more ropey. Like here's artificial sinew just in like a tan color. In the handle here, you've got some things. You got a wrench and you got a couple needle sizes. You can pretty easily tell which needle is which. One's longer than the other, also thicker. I'm going to use a smaller one because this isn't for like a sail or something. All you got to do is loosen this nut up here. You just stick that thread in the groove, retract the thread into the machine onto the bobbin, pulling the needle with it till the needle stops. Then you can tighten the nut to hold the needle in and you run your thread through the uh, thing there. But hang on, let me change this out. I'm going to use the artificial sinew. I want to use the black cord, but I don't have any. So I'm going to, I'm going to switch it out for, for this. All right, change my mind. There's actually quite a bit more on here than I realized. So let me give you a closer view of what's going on here. There is a little groove in that needle. It's really hard to see. But you take the uh, thread, whatever you're using, I've got artificial sinew, and you stick it in that groove on the needle there, and just hold it down. Spin your your little bobbin here to make the the uh, thread retract into the, the thing here, and it pulls the needle in with it. Once the needle bottoms out, you can go ahead and tighten this nut. Maybe. There we go. Take your thread from the um, whatever side it's it's uh, the groove in the needle is. Run that through the needle. You thread this one up front instead of in the back like a standard needle. There you go. So you got the thread going through the needle there. And then to sew with this thing, I'm gonna grab a scrap piece and I'll show you. To sew with this thing, what you do is you stick your needle all the way through there, like so, find your thread, pull it through, and you're going to want to pull through enough extra thread for however much length of a thing you're going to sew. Once you get that, you pull this back through, keeping the thread on this side, go to the, this first one's always kind of a pain because it wants to come apart, go to the next spot, keeping the the part where it's pulling away from the needle towards the, the last stitch. Stick that through the next part where you're going to sew. And then when you back the needle out, careful, and you'll see a little... It's out of the way. You'll see a little bubble start to form right here on the edge of the needle where it uh, is not the leading side. I'm not sure how to word that. Take your, your trail thread here and you stick that through there and then just hold it down while you go ahead and pull the needle the rest of the way out and that loop will tighten around it and now you have one single lock stitch it's called a lock stitch because the stitch is now locked in here and you just continue that all the way down the whole thing 
If you want to learn how to do all kind of sewing stuff like that, I highly recommend this book right here. Um, it's simply called Leatherwork Manual, so that might be difficult to find. But there's the um, author's names that might help narrow it down. This book is probably about 20 years older than I am, and it has anything you could ever want to know about all the sewing stuff. And all kind of other stuff. So yeah, definitely pick this up if you can find Leatherwork Manual. It's uh, super handy to have. So I'm just going to do this stitching style all the way down all these straps. I'll be using this thing and it'll take me like, you know, a week. Alright, so uh, full disclosure here, I did try sewing it the way I just showed you. I went through and um, did the uh, little spur to mark out my sewing holes. I couldn't get the needle through, so I went back in and used the uh, rake style hole punch to just, you know, do the holes in a nice straight line. And then I sewed it up that way. Problem was, I couldn't turn it wrong side out because it was too tight. So then I went back through and I just used a needle and thread and uh, sewed it up that way. But I still ended up not liking these straps because, well, they're too thin and that stitching looks terrible. I want the straps for the shoulders to be about the same width as the one that I used for the, uh, the belt section. And that was a three inch wide piece of leather. So went through and uh, cut some new straps. All I did there was put the line down the middle so I knew where to fold the edge to. And then just put some glue down that line this stuff says to put it on and wait 20 minutes, and uh, it looks like it dried out, but actually that's when it's actually sticky, is after about 20 minutes. Which is good, because that gives you enough work time to spread your glue evenly and make sure you're all set up and all that before you actually start sticking it together. So all you really got to do is fold one edge over, stick it to the, uh, the middle line there, and while you're doing that, hold like further down where you're going to be folding it. Hold that up a little so that it doesn't end up veering off of your line. And then just use a piece of a dowel or soda can or whatever, something round to just roll it out nice and flat. Now if the seam is not tight enough for you, you want the actual edges of the leather to touch and glue up, you can peel it open like this and then put some more glue in. But uh, I'm not going to do that because that will actually stain the leather. I don't want to stain this. If you are going to be dyeing it, you can go right ahead. Don't worry, you're not going to see that. But uh, I'm not dyeing this, so I don't want to stain it real bad like that. Just showing you how you could do that. And then, of course, I'm going to use the same method. Just uh, draw the line where you want it to fold to and put the glue down and fold it over for all the seams around the edges of the apron itself. For buckles, there are tons of options. You can just buy buckles if you want. I actually really like this system better, though, where you use two D-rings and you run into the uh, strap through both of them over and then through one, and that will hold forever. That'll never pull out and it's easily adjustable. And you don't have to worry about poking holes in your leather you can get it the exact adjustment you want. You don't have to worry about the whole spacing and all that stuff. To hold the straps on, I'm just going to use some little bits of this uh, really stiff leather here. Just put two D-rings on one of those, fold it over, and I'm going to glue it for now so that it'll hold still for me when I go to put the rivets and stuff in it. For attaching the straps to the belt, I'm just going to loop over the bottom end of them and then poke a couple holes above where the belt is so that I can put some rivets in those holes and they'll have little loops built in. This is a rotary hole punch. They're pretty good. They have a wide selection of um, you know, hole sizes you can punch. But of course a hammer punch or anything is fine too. And we'll just take a couple of these rivets here. These are, these are pretty cool little rivets. Um, one end has a post and one end has the receiver. They just sort of snap together and then you smoosh them with a hammer or a pair of pliers or whatever you want to use. Personally, I like to use pliers because if you hammer them, you're going to end up flattening the top of the dome, and I want to try to keep the, uh, the dome. I like the way that looks. So if you are going to use pliers, just use something that doesn't have any teeth on it or that will actually scratch it up pretty bad. And I wanted the strap holders that are going to be visible to have something of a nicer in it. I want them to just be square on the end. So I just used a glue bottle as like a round form to you know make an outline and trim that out, just so it's rounded off on the edge. And then go over it with the edge beveler to kind of clean it up so it's not, you know, sharp angles. Figured out where I wanted the rivets on these and uh, poked the holes out. Then I figured out where exactly I want them on the apron and then used the uh, holes that I'd already punched through for the rivets to mark on the, the apron where to punch holes into it. 
Once all your holes are marked and punched out, you can go ahead and stick the rivet through your strap holder, buckle holder thing and the apron itself and just rivet that together. Once you've got your shoulder straps on there and looped through the belt, you can then pull the belt around your back to figure out where exactly you want the belt to attach on the apron. I just held it on one side and uh, went ahead and marked that and then used that mark as a measurement to go down from the other side. And then it's pretty much the same idea, just figure out where you want your holes and rivet the stuff together. So with the belt though, I only riveted it on one side and on the other side I used that spare strap holder. One thing I really like for smashing these rivets is a set of welder's clamps. They have a really big jaw on them so they can reach in pretty far and they have a flat um, jaw where they actually smash the stuff together so you don't have to worry about scarring up your rivets with them. So every good apron needs to have some uh, custom embroidery or your name or a patch or something on it, right? So I'm going to do my logo here. I printed it out, not really paying much attention to what size I printed it, and then found something that fit the size of the logo in a circle. In my case, it happened to be this um, roll of uh, blue painter's tape here. So I just put the painter's tape down on some six ounce leather and uh, trace around it. And then used the rotary cutter to trim out the bulk of it. And then I went back in with the razor blade and trimmed off, you know, nice and neat. It's definitely not a perfect circle. There are a couple little spots here and there. But if you are going to be, you know, making a whole bunch of leather circles, you can get die cutters or just buy leather circles. Uh, I happen to have the, the little scrap of six ounce laying around, so I just went ahead and used that. I don't mind if the circle is not 100% perfect. Go ahead and take the edge beveler to it and trim up all the edges, make them nice and clean. Figured out what my spacing was going to be and used the uh, groover tool to cut a groove all the way around it. That's where the stitching is going to be. And then I went through and used the stitch spacer, that spur on the wheel thing, to go ahead and mark around the, uh, the groove there where I want my stitches to be. I'm using the largest size spur thing that it comes with. Then I went through and pre-punched the holes on this using the sewing awl. You could use a standard hole punch like that one that's laying there. kind of looks like a spike on a stick. But uh, I wanted it to be the exact same size as the needle. The least amount of stretching as possible. So now I get some uh, water on a sponge. You don't want it dripping wet, but decently, a little bit more than damp. And uh, rub down the leather, the whole thing. Make it equally wet all the way across. Give it a couple minutes to sit and let the water soak in some. And then we can uh, start tooling. But while that's soaking in, we're going to need a pattern. This stuff here is a clear transfer plastic. It's kind of like the uh, old school you know, film slide projector stuff. And uh, you can see through it a little bit, like it's got a little bit of whiteness to it, but you can see through it. And uh, you just tape your pattern onto one side of it, and then flip it over and trace your pattern with a pen or a marker, whatever you want to use. And then you can tape that down to your leather and use the stylus. That's actually what the pokey thing is called. It's a stylus if you're looking to buy one. You use the ball end of it and just trace over where you just traced a minute ago. That will imprint the lines into your leather. There we go, that's pretty good. And uh, once you've done one of these things, don't throw the plastic deal away because even if the ink rubs off, the, uh, the plastic still has that indention in it. So you can reuse this a bunch of times. So now I'm going to take this tool here, it's called a swivel knife, put down a little bit of this compound on the back end of some leather, and strop the blade just to make sure that there are no little burrs or anything on it. And then you use that to go over all those lines that you indented and cut them in. You guys who know how to work leather or watch a lot of Dark Horse Armory or one of those are probably screaming at me right now because I don't have the blade straight up and down. And I realize that, that is intentional. I'm actually tilting it on purpose because I want to control the angle of the bevel that it's cutting in. If your leather has gotten too dry at some point between doing the, the stylus pen and anything else where you took a break or something, that's fine. You can re-wet it. Just make sure that anytime you re-wet the leather that you re-wet the entire thing evenly, even parts that you're not working on yet, and give it a few minutes to soak in. But once you're all done with the cutting in, the uh, only tool I'm really going to use here for stamps is an edge beveler. You could get crazy and use a whole ton of different things, like backgrounding stamps or um, 
you know, any kind of fancy tool like that. The thing is, though, these stamps are like 25 bucks a piece. So uh, definitely just like maybe pick up a starter set or just buy one or two. So what you're going to do with this edge beveler is you put the flat side towards your design or towards the part that you don't want to flatten and the beveled side to the side you want to flatten and just sort of move it along while you hammer it down repeatedly. I know it's really hard to see what I'm doing here. It's um, hard for me to see what I'm doing, but you don't really push the beveler into the leather. You're just sort of moving it. You let the hammer do the work for you. And you trace around the whole pattern that way. If you come across an area that you didn't cut deep enough or it's not beveling right or something, you can go ahead and cut that some more. If your leather gets too dry, it's not going to bevel properly. Also, if it's too wet, it won't bevel properly. It'll be like gummy. That's not what you want. So you will probably have to end up rewetting the leather a few times, even on a pattern this small. Once you've got your edges beveled, you can go back in with your stylus and your design to make sure you get the little holes and little dots and spots that were too small to reach with the beveler. I'm just poking the little dots that were put in here by Sam. She, uh, Sam Stars did the uh, logo for me. She's awesome. You can find a link to her website or her Facebook down below. So once you're all happy with that, using some gloves, because this stuff is meant to dye skin, so don't get it on your skin. Using a damp sponge and a damp piece of leather, get your favorite dye of choice. You can use like a liquid or a gel or whatever you prefer. I like the gel antique because it makes the leather look a whole lot like it does when it's wet. And you get a pretty fair amount there on your sponge and just rub it in. Too much is not a bad thing because you probably end up going to have to put more anyway. But go ahead and put it all over. Don't forget your edges. Don't forget the little groove for the sewing. Just make sure there's no natural leather color showing. You can do the back a little bit if you need to. Probably not necessary, but I always like to get like just the very edge in case something curls over. Then get you a paper towel and buff off the excess. If it's not deep enough in your grooves, you can put more on there and then very, very carefully wipe it off with a paper towel to make sure that it stays in the groove. But if you do put more on there, just make sure that you put it everywhere, otherwise you're going to get an uneven staining. There we go. Now we can leave that to dry. That'll take um, probably about two or three hours. I don't know what the bottle says. I never bothered to look. About two or three hours is what I go with. That's what it should look like when it dries out. It gets a little bit lighter. And I'm going to seal it up with some of the Super Sheen. I poured way too much out here, but that's okay, actually. But you're supposed to put quite a bit on there. I ran out of the little um, cotton ball dauber things, but uh, yeah, just put some on there. Make sure it's all over, same as you did with the uh, dye. Just make sure it's in every little crack and crevice. If your thing wasn't completely dry, or maybe sometimes even after it is, depending on the color of dye you're using, you'll end up pulling some of the dye out with the Super Sheen. That's fine. Get it all over, and uh, if you got way too much like I did, you can just sop up the extra with a paper towel. And once that is actually good and dry for sure, like actually dry, next day or so, you can go back in with a clean cloth or something and buff it to make it really shiny. I usually skip the buffing step because I kind of don't care, but uh, that's how the bottle says to make it shiny if you want to make it shiny. So now let's figure out where this thing is going to go. My first thought was to put it in the extreme upper right section of the apron, but then I realized I want to put a tool pouch on here and I want them to kind of line up like it's not going to match exactly because the tool pouch is a different shape but i want it to work out so i went ahead and got some of this leather here this is the really stiff stuff i used for the straps i'm going to use that to make the tool pouch first and then i'll uh, figure out where they go on the apron i decided to go with a pouch style that is sewn onto the apron that way anything i stick into the little tool holder if you know like say a pin blows up and leaks or something it only leaks inside the pouch and not on the apron, so I could pop the rivets and replace it if I need to. Or if I decide I don't like it, I can just take the rivets out at some point. But uh, figure out what size you want your little pouch to be. I'm using my pins as an example. And go ahead and cut out your piece. And then you can put some glue along the edges and fold it over into a little pouch. And let that glue set up. Once that's good to go, you can forget to turn your camera on and... Uh, explain what you're doing here. So what I did is I uh, figured out where I wanted the very top corner rivet to be and went off of that and then figured out where the other ones would be placed in a line down the thing. 
I ended up going with one inch apart on each of these rivets. Did that on both sides and on the, uh, the middle. I ended up not riveting the top back portion of this to the apron itself. I may go back and change that, but it seems fine for right now. So go ahead and figure out where all those are going to go. And you can mark out where the uh, tool pouch is sitting, where the patch is going to be sitting. I took my pin and just stuck it through the uh, pre-punched holes on the patch to figure out where I want that. And then marked through the holes that I punched in the pouch for the apron itself. This is also where I lined up where the stuff's going to be sitting in relation to each other. So I'm just going to go ahead and sew the patch on the way I showed you before, like I'm actually sewing it for reals this time. And the pouch I'm going to go ahead and rivet the way I riveted everything else. And there we go, now I have an apron. Got my patch, my little tool pouch with some tools in it. The shoulder straps are adjustable. The uh, back portion here, you can adjust those straps to wherever you know it's comfortable for you on the belt. So that's how I made this apron. I really like the harness style over the one that goes around the back of your neck. Even though my tool pouch really isn't that heavy, it's still a lot more comfortable. And of course with this being suede, you might want to uh, hit it with some Camp Dry or Scotch Guard, something like that to protect it from glue and spatter and whatever else. But of course, as always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and I'll catch you on the next one.